So today we'll be discussing the Battle of the Somme. Now this uh, took place during the First World War and Lord Kitchener had summoned um, a new army. And this was mostly volunteer volunteers and they were uh, often called pal battalions or buddy battalions where it was friends from local places who joined the same group to fight together. And the Somme was a river in France and this is one of the best examples of trench warfare. And trenches, as you know, tunnels dug into the ground, opposing sides. Not tunnels like trenches, literally trenches dug into the ground on opposing sides. And um, they were the trenches were between 16 to 25 miles long. I presume 16 miles is as a crow flies and 25 is as a return and curve and so forth. Now, they were so close to each other's side that they could hear talking, coughing, uh, their cooking. At some points they were uh, just about 50 yards away from each other. Now I'm not exactly sure what yards are. We work in meters in South Africa, but yards, yeah. So it was the Germans against the British and the France, and the French, I'm sorry about that. And we explained that um, the Somme was anonymous with trench warfare. So uh, this was a deadlock. Both sides couldn't move. Both were stuck in their trenches and between them uh, was no man's land where no one could go. So uh, the Germans were outnumbered about one to six against the British and the French. But unlike the British, the British were mostly volunteer soldiers where the Germans were already pretty uh, hardened soldiers. They were veterans and they had already uh, had... Um, uh, compulsory service for two years, that's all the word, compulsory, and um, the German aim was, uh, this is a very common phrase, to bleed France white, so among the places they destroyed were places of very importance, of great importance uh, and heritage to France. And by mid-1916 the f uh, French were nearing their breaking point, and especially at places near Verdun, which was uh, also very significant culturally to, to the country. And uh, the French needed the British to divert attention from places like Verdun. So this is why the first uh, attempt at breaking through at the Somme uh, was attempted. So uh, we're going to focus on this first major breakthrough, and this was in July 1916, or the first attempt. And the British would bombard the German lines with more bombs than would would have uh, than more that was ever basically used and then the Germans would basically just move from their lines quickly and just move back as soon as the bombardment stopped so it proved to be very ineffective and uh, the B British their biggest flaw was that their um, the guys the commanders higher up in the echelon couldn't improvise and deviate from battle plans so the guys on the ground couldn't improvise and um, do what they they had to wait for orders basically from upstairs and the guys upstairs couldn't deviate from battle plans that were made before the battle actually started so you had to improvise and work with what was happening so that was their biggest flaw and the Somme ended up being a disaster for the British and they learned the only good thing was that they learned a lot from the Somme but uh, they expected basically everything to go go its clockwork and it really really didn't it went terribly for them so from the sum, the term over the top that you often use in the English language came from where the soldiers would go over the top of the trenches. So these days, anything that's, you know, too much or extreme is over the top. So this was where that phrase came from, is when you would go over the top in the trenches. Because as soon as you would lift your head, you would basically be machine gunned. And, and this was the first time that machine guns really saw action in warfare. So... It was extremely going over the top, it was basically suicide. This is why they called it no man's land. The space between there, if you went there, you were basically a dead man. There was barbed wire, span, spun, I'm not sure what exactly the word is there, but basically it was very difficult uh, to stay alive in no man's land. It was basically guaranteed, it was suicide to go there. And um, so the machine guns I often refer to, I find this very beautiful, as a, as a storm of lead or a rain of bullets. And um, this was still new, remember, because it was still like in the time when they were still using bayonets. So the machine guns were quite revolutionary. And uh, this was the first time in history that the tank actually saw action and they were deploy deployed by the British. So this was the first time that people actually used tanks in battlefield. And many, for many people, it was the first time actually seeing this. They had no way to conceptualize or to word, the word to find words for, for what they were seeing. And... At Thiepval, 
is the biggest uh, British war memorial, and this is uh, before Mame Forest. I'm, maybe I'm pronouncing that word wrong. I, the, it's on the next page. I'll see that word again, so I'll be sure about the pronunciation. But Mame Forest, and it's, um, it's uh, dedicated to about 70 unknown soldiers whose graves are unknown, so whose bodies were either destroyed or buried in the ground in bombs and terrible terrible and and the biggest British more war memorial and it took about uh, four months for the British before they actually could start breaking through so that's like a 411 on the, uh, the Somme and what it's actually but now the real important part is going to be so they called this uh, the poets um, well basically there was more poets and f literary figures here than in any other war so I'm going to try and focus on that a bit so I'm going to start with Robert Graves, and uh, he was a poet, and yes, it was Mame Woods, is that uh, where, where at the FL, where that uh, monument is located, but so Robert Graves, uh, he's well known for war poetry, obviously, but uh, one of the poems I just wanted to mention about him was A Dead Bosch, where in this Mame Woods, it was the first time the British had to go to war actually in Woods, they weren't really prepared for it, and the Germans were, were very well prepared, so it was a slaughter for the British, but they did actually win, and uh, afterwards the place was uh, bodies everywhere, so he, uh, Robert Graves was walking through and he came across a few scenes and made a huge impact on him. One, that were, were two mutually, a British and a German guy, who mutually impaled each other with bayonets, so they were both standing impaled, uh, so pretty, pretty graphic Im imagery there, and then this A Dead Bosch is his one poem. And um, it describes, you know, a dead German uh, with black blood coming out of his nose and his mouth. So very graphic, really. So you can see how the influences... Oh, sorry, I had a bit of gas there. Pardon me. Damn. So it had a huge influence on their poetry and their literature. So um, Robert Graves actually had German heritage, and I was pretty proud of this. And he actually carried Nietzsche, who was also German, uh, the philosopher's work book in his, in his pocket. He carried Nietzsche around with him and um, he actually was wounded at one stage uh, and his commanding officer had thought he was dead and had actually sent a letter to his uh, family telling them that he had died and the war office or yeah the war office actually sent a telegram to his family as well uh, informing them that he's dead and everyone thought he was dead for about two to three days even his friend Siegfried Sassoon who we'll get to next thought he was dead and it had a huge influence on him where he almost felt like everything he was before the war had actually really died there. Initially, he thought it was a big joke that everyone thought he was dead and that he was like uh, pretty, but then after a while he got pretty angry because he wasn't paid because everyone thought he was dead for those few days, so he didn't get paid, so that kind of angered him a bit. But the worst part is that he really felt off, after that moment he was someone else, so he really died there and came, and was, came back as someone else, really. And now Siegfried Sassoon, is the next one I'm going to talk about, and he actually won a medal, the MC. I'm just quickly going to pause this because uh, I hear um, someone at the gate. Sorry about that. So um, the next person we're going to talk about is Siegfried Sassoon. So he's actually a decorated war hero. He won the MC, which is a military cross. It's, I think at the third level you can get medal of um, rank of medal you can get as an officer. And uh, he's famous for his memoirs, amongst many other things, but, he, but his memoirs I find very, the name, be beautiful, and you'll see why he also named it this. His memoirs is called uh, Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man. And he was, because he was a war hero, his criticism of the war, he would eventually become a critic, was very powerful because this was coming from someone who, who was considered a war hero. And um, he got his MC uh, for saving a certain Corporal O'Brien, and he was very proud of the fact that he got a medal for saving a life instead of taking one. And he didn't actually save the life, but he, uh, you can read up on this story. Corporal O'Brien was shot, and he had to, he was a big guy, an Irishman, so two guys had to take him out. Eventually, Sassoon ran back to get another guy. They still could only get him halfway out of the ditch, so he ran back a fourth time, and on the way back, uh, O'Brien still actually died, but um, he, he ended up getting a medal for, for his heroism. And 
what's pretty interesting, what I find also beautiful, sorry if I'm sounding a bit sentimental about Siegfried Sassoon, is he gave a book to Wilfred o Owen, who was another poet, so Wilfred Owen, and this book was called Nothing of Importance, which was a memoir of Bernard Adams. So Sassoon gave Wilfred Owen Nothing of Importance, and Nothing of Importance was written by Bernard Adams, who was also an officer who had served with Sassoon in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers in the Somme. And um, the sad thing is uh, Bernard Adams actually died, but yeah, he served with Sassoon in the Royal Welsh Fus Fusiliers, and his book is Nothing of Importance. And so what Siegfried did is uh, he listed the names of all the officers in, this, in his copy of Nothing of Importance. And uh, after a year, of all the names he had listed, only four weren't dead or wounded. So an extreme amount of people uh, had died. And what's so significant about the name Nothing of Importance and why he gave him, you can al almost imagine this is me giving you Nothing of Importance, is because it's cause it was a phrase that was often used in the war office when, let's say, an, not too much happened the day. There wasn't any great attempt to break through. So uh, they said, uh, What's, what's, what happened today? Please report on today. And they would say, uh, nothing of importance happened. But what was really actually happening is uh, young men were dying, families were losing brothers, husbands, sons. So even though for them it was nothing of importance, for the men on the ground a lot was happening, a, a lot of importance. So that's the importance of nothing of importance. And the book and listed in Sassoon's own hand is the names and dates of all the officers as they arrived and as they died, and only four were alive after, after uh, a year. So Private David Jones is another uh, literary figure. He's famous for in parenthes parenthesis. I'm not going to talk too much about him. Then um, William Noel Hodgson, uh, he also died, which is a damn shame, and which kind of makes his, he's famous for Before Action, a poem. And it almost makes it so powerful because he did actually die, and he wrote this before, before action, so kind of describing what happens before they go over the top. And William Noel Hodginson, this guy, he actually wrote under pen name Edward Melbourne. And he didn't tell the people he was serving with who he actually was, and that he was... Uh, uh, was a well-read uh, poet and he, today is largely forgotten which is a shame but before action was very popular and was very powerful bef because the fact that, that he actually did die and this goes this is a poem that says kind of goes to all the parents at home who had kids uh, and wondering what they felt like before and this is and who they can't ask kids who died and who they can't ask what it was like and what so um, heavy stuff I'm sorry guys and um, Frank Richards is um, his memoir is called Old Soldiers Never Die and this is a phrase that is often used uh, by generals old soldiers never die especially when they retire old soldiers never die and um, it's his memoir memoir Frank Richards is Frank Richards it says in memoir, and it's edited by Robert Graves. And Graves said about Frank Richards, uh, and I quote, only Tommy that's as good with a pen as he is with a musket. So he said he's as good with a pen as he is with a musket, this Frank Richards. And Graves said this about him. And next is the one we all probably know the best is uh, J.R.R. R. Tolkien, so Lord of the Rings. And before the war, he was actually very unclear about his writing. But he formed, uh, he grew in his writing a lot during the war. And you can see uh, this as well. For instance, I mentioned previously this was the first time that tanks were deployed in warfare. So Tolkien was one of the first to witness these tanks. And you can just imagine the influence it must have had on him. He had way, no way of describing what these things were. And in his book, um, The Fall of Gondolin, there are actually these, these mechanical moving dragons. So mechanical dragons, you can almost see the, uh, the metaphor there. And in Lord of the Rings, a scene we've, most of us have probably seen in the Dead Marshes, uh, where it's Frodo, I think, and, and Sam are, and then they see these dead figures in the water looking up at them. Now, this was very similar to what the psalm looked like, 
uh, after the autumn rains and bodies were so deep into the marshes and swamps that they were literally unrecoverable. So there were bodies rotting and, and um, floating and I'm sure I don't need to describe too much of it. And um, But yeah, very sad as well. And he also served in the Royal Welsh Fusiliers and he eventually got trench fever and trench fever is something you get from lice and now next I'm going to give a short description on this lice because that's pretty interesting as well but it's a very serious disease that you can actually get it can take you out of the field completely because it's uh, relapsing but trench fever and you get it from lice and sorry guys I had to cut that one in half because it's too big to import into my video editor so I'm going to cut it, add this, and then put on the second cut. So sorry if it's a bit odd oh, that cut through. Okay. Because it's uh, relapsing, but trench fever and you get it from lice. And yeah, I think Tolkien but doesn't need too much of an in, in, uh, explanation. So now uh, Isaac Rosenberg. Now this is where the lice come in, so he, his poem that's the most powerful for me is Louse Hunting. And really, if you read it, it's scary as... F it's, it's, a, it's a scary, it's a very moving, deep, scary, like it's difficult to just, just read it. Louse Hunting by Isaac Rosenberg. So he was actually a pacifist who, um, who needed money. And, oh, wait, no, I've got this wrong. Yeah, no, 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 sorry, sorry. No, yeah, so um, so it was Rosenberg who wrote Laos Hunting. Sorry, this is a long one, and I'm trying to do it as in one go, because I actually need to be somewhere. But um, he was actually a pacifist who needed money, so he joined the war just because he needed money. He, he, he was a, a full-on pacifist. So um, in this Laos Hunting, like he describes like a devil's pantomime, because he would say, like, the only way you could... The, okay, so just a story on the lice. The lice would give you this disease, trench fever, and the lice would lay their eggs inside the seams of your clothing. So inside like these. So the only way you could try and do something about it was you would take like candles and fire and you would like take the seams of your clothes and like if this was the top of the candle, take the seam on top and as you take it on top it would go... You would hear like lice, louse, lice, louse, eggs popping. Sorry, I got confused there with the plural forms, but so you would hear like eggs popping. And as one person would start doing this, everyone else would start scratching their skins and then everyone would take out their clothing and they would basically be like, you know, half naked with their clothes on top of fire and candles and like popping, popping. And he describes it as though they're controlled by a devil's pantomime and he described these shadows against the wall. Scary. Yeah, just, just, just read it. And... Um, like you can really see how it's this futile you can't win against the lice and it became like a metaphor for kind of uh, the sum for what was going on at the sum and for the war itself in general and Isaac Rosenberg also killed but read the last hunting by his son Rosenberg it's really really good and I just like yeah the sum was basically useless strategically uh, the British eventually broke through after about four months but then the Germans just moved back to the Hindenburg line which was like on their home turf basically uh, well it was a field of their choosing they could defend it with less men so they were really in a better position and this at, at the sum nearly a million people died and it was basically for a piece of ground that was completely uh, useless and this is, at the sum is basically where the phrase no man's land was popularized it's an old term I, I think it can be traced back to like the 11th century but it was popular, popularized uh, in the media and like on the press and, and by reporters uh, during this time to describe the space between the trenches. And I hope I described the trenches adequately. I wish I could draw a picture. Maybe I should quickly draw a picture of the trenches someplace. Which one of them? I've read this one, yeah. So this is a trench. So this would be like one trench and like 50 yards between. So that little... I don't know if you can see it. I hope you can. Let me make it thick as well. Oh, I'm wasting time. Never mind. Let me leave this and just continue. So, um, and uh, yeah, I've just mentioned like the, the British 
side, but there were German poets as well, like Ernst, Ernst Jünger, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing everything right, but Ernst Jünger, he was also a German, a German poet. And um, another powerful poem that I think you should read is They by Sassoon. And I'm just going to do like a short, short run through of it, but it's like the bishop, it starts off and he's like, well, it doesn't start off, but it gets to the point where he's like, and the bishop says, when the boys come back, they will not be the same. And then he continues saying they are fighting the Antichrist, they're fighting the good fight, they are doing, you know, God's work, that kind of thing. You know, you can just imagine how it goes on, how, because that's a fact, they, priests, the government send you to die and send you to fight and to kill other people. And then um, it goes on to say, and now I'm going to quote this. Uh, so begin quote. We're none of us the same, the boys replied. George lost both his legs. Bill is stone blind. Poor Jim is shot through the lungs and would like to die. And Bert's gone syphilitic. So that syphilitic is a kind of, yes, it's a tough word. Oh, end quote, before I said that syphilitic. Yeah, so um, for a lot of these um, of these figures, literary figures, literary, I'm saying that word wrong the whole time, so I'm just going to call them writers. Yeah, writers, there we go, writers. So for most of these writers, whether it was poem or books or, or, or fiction or whatever they were writing, it, this signified a huge turn in their style. For instance, Sassoon became known for his sarcastic criticism critic style, like this they, so they by Siegfried Sassoon is this thing where the bishop and the boys replied when none, none of us is saying, go read that, but that, he became known, known for that kind of poetry, or well, that's what he's remembered for today. And um, you can just imagine among these officers and soldiers, it wasn't popular to, or it wasn't considered very manly to talk about poetry, so they would like, uh, between each other, have these code words, so they would go to each other and say, uh, I'd like to show you my recipe for rum punch. And then, you know, you would actually go show, um, show them the recipe. And, uh, yeah, also not to forget, like, as I said, there were Germans, you know, I'm just focusing on the British now, but also, you know, it's not only poets. They call this uh, the Poets' Battalion. I wish I find that I can find that word, but they call it the Poets' Battalion, as far as I can remember. But um, there were these Royal Welsh Fusiliers. But just, yeah, this is what I just wanted to say. It's not everyone were like these have fancy schmancy writers and you know with big words and stuff like some of them were like common common illiterate people who couldn't read who couldn't write who were just as much you know heroes and just experienced the same thing and just like an example of one of these average joes illiterate couldn't read couldn't write is private frederick edward and vc so i hope you've watched my video on the on the vc the victoria cross if you haven't please do but um, so Private Frederick Edward, he also won the VC and a damn shame after the war he actually had to sell his VC just to make ends meet and a lot of uh, people returning from the war had this, you know, at that time there wasn't even a word for shell-shocked or uh, today what they call post, post P PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, that thing, like they just thought you were kind of crazy and um, yeah, so this Private Frederick Edwards won the VC and he took out like machine guns with like grenades, he would like throw a grenade, like go into the rubble, throw another grenade, move closer, move closer, and took out a machine gun by himself. And um, just another interesting fact is, or just uh, like they called the trenches, they would name them like affectionately, like Bois Francais and Shaftesbury Avenue, and names like this, and Queen's Moulin, like Moulin was a name. Uh, in an Indian word, so you can almost see the colonial influence still. I think for either a ditch or a or a kind of hillish thing. And um, I'll close off with this: like at that Mame Woods, there were a few woods where there were huge, huge casualties, but Mame Woods was terrible. And the British just calls it Mamet because you spell it Mam Met, so the British just called it Mamet Woods. But um, there, there is this monument that says. Um, Oh, this is at uh, the biggest British one I spoke about earlier. So the Devonshire uh, Fusiliers, I reckon, I, I assume were the ones. I only saw a small portion of this, but this is just what's beautiful. It says uh, the Devonshires held the line, and they held uh, the Devonshires held the line, and they hold it still. Sorry, I screwed that up so badly. I'm just going to say it again. The Devonshires held the line, and they hold it still because most of them are still lying there. So. 
Um, yeah, and just for interest sake, like the British were called, they called themselves Tommies. So the other one I told you, um, Graves said about, um, Graves said about Richards, Frank Richards, that is the only Tommy that's as good with the pen as he is with the musket. So a Tommy was what uh, the British were called and the Bosch is what the Germans were called. And Siegfried Sassoon, uh, like something that had a huge influence on him is, and just that's also quite memorable for me, as he says, he walked past a German, a dead German, and he propped them up. Uh, the guy was slumped, slumped sideways, so he propped them up sitting like I'm sitting now, and walked off, and when he came back again, uh, and this is his words, the, um, the guy was, and I'll start, quote, trodden deeper into the mud, end quote. So, um, he realized that everyone was suffering, and this time it was like a German mother who was suffering. And uh, the, they actually called Siegfried Sassoon Mad Jack because he, he, he would go on these suicidal missions, and um, he really found a purpose in warfare, to be honest. And what... Uh, yeah, this is just what I said earlier about why his memoirs is called Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man. Is Apparently before the war, he couldn't find a place to fit in, and the only thing he actually excelled in was the gentlemanly, the gentlemanly pursuit of uh, fox hunting. So the gentlemanly pursuit of fox hunting was the only thing he really excelled at, and then came the war where he was amazing at it as well. So... Yeah, you can still walk around in Mamay Woods and you can still find boots and weapons if you look hard enough and you know, then you know, like there are two things a soldier never leaves behind and that's his boots and his, uh, and his weapon. So you know it's probably dead man's boots and dead man's weapon. So yeah, it just goes to show about war and all that. So um, I hope you understand trenches. I tried to do a picture, but I like just go read up on this as well. Like this is already 25 minutes where it's supposed to be 10. So I'm sorry about that. But yeah, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks for listening. I hope it was interesting. And uh, if there's something anyone wants to see, please let me know so I know what to do next. Kind of give me some inspiration because uh, I'm running low at this stage. Cool. Catch up.